So thank you all for coming. I guess uh, we have also people online uh, watching from their offices. Um, it's my pleasure to have today here Christopher Berger uh, from Karolinska Institute. Uh, for those who don't know, this is the institute that gives the Nobel Prizes. And he has been uh, doing a wonderful work here as a visiting researcher. He's moving now into Caltech. He will explain uh, his previous work. Uh, he has has publication on uh, current biology, scientific reports of nature, uh, journal of neuroscience, and cerebral cortex. So very important uh, work. And then he will uh, show how he's moving into uh, multimodal devices, all these learnings from neuroscience. Thank you for coming. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Uh, thank you guys uh, for coming and for the introduction. Uh, so uh, the work uh, that I'm going to talk to you about today is the work that I've been doing here over the past uh, about five months or so um, at Microsoft Research. And it's really focused around this question of how we can get the most out of multimodal devices. Um, so and mostly I'm going to be talking about work uh, that I've been doing um, in virtual reality. Um, in that space, but in principle, most of the things I'm going to talk about could apply to really any sort of multimodal device. Um, so uh, this work really stems from work that I'm doing on the basic perceptual science side, um, uh, from work in my PhD and during a postdoc in, mul in, uh, in a field what's known as multisensory perception. So uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, perceptual research first as sort of a primer to understand sort of the background and why we're asking the questions that we're asking um, and how we're trying to get the most out of uh, multimodal devices. So to start with, um, uh, the classic view in sensory, human sensory perception is that we have all of these different sensors and different parts of the brain are sort of functionally uh, distinct and they process only parts of the brain, only uh, information from sensors in a very uh, segre segregated way. So you get the visual cortex, which is responsible for processing uh, visual information, and the auditory cortex responsible for processing auditory information, et cetera. And there's very little communication between them. But so the modern thinking, or uh, more recent findings, suggest that uh, this is a really limited uh, way of viewing human perception. Um, and in fact, it leaves out the, the multi-sensory environment in which most people actually live in their everyday environment. And it's really important to consider uh, how the senses interact. And so if you want to consider uh, visual perception, if you want to understand uh, the visual system, then you have to take into account uh, the multi-sensory environment in which that visual uh, event is occurring, for example. Um, and so uh, classic... Uh, work in, a, in, in, human neuro, in neuroscience, actually, not human neuroscience, in neuroscience, basic neuroscience, <clears throat> uh, really uh, created a renaissance in this field of perceptual research when they found they were digging around uh, recording from a, a neurons in the uh, part of the brain of cats, uh, which is responsible for orienting behavior. So uh, if you, you know, orient your head to look at something, uh, some stimulus in the environment. And what they would do is they would record uh, from cells in this part of the brain known as the superior colliculus, and they would present the cat with a visual object, and they would see a cell spike. Um, and then they would present the cat with an auditory uh, stimulus, and they would see a cell spike. Uh, but more importantly, what was really striking is when they would present the cat with a visual and an auditory stimulus uh, together at the same time, uh, this same cell would not only spike, but it would fire uh, well above and beyond the additive response of uh, visual and auditory information presented alone, suggesting that these neurons uh, were uh, actually selectively tuned to process information from more than one sense uh, at a time. Um, and this has important implications uh, for uh, our understanding of, uh, uh, of how the... How the uh, uh, sensory apparatus uh, of our, uh, our sensory systems uh, integrate information from vision and touch and uh, sound, et cetera, because it, this is an open question in neuroscience at the time. So we have all these sensors and we have all these uh, specific centers of the brain that are responsible for processing them, but how does the communication work? How is it that we don't just see a dog and then separately hear a dog and then, and then 
how are we not confused by these separate pieces of information? Um, and so uh, subsequent neuroimaging findings and uh, electrophysiology recordings in primates and later in humans have found uh, that different combinations of these stimuli um, would elicit the same kinds of responses uh, in the brain. And these responses uh, uh, would occur for stimuli that occur within a certain spatial window. So stimuli that occur within a very close uh, uh, area of space. And for stimuli that occur within a certain uh, temporal window. So stimuli that occur within a certain uh, uh, area of time. So close together in time. Um, and so one of the tools that we uh, have to understand uh, sensory perception in humans is what is known as uh, multisensory illusions. And multisensory illusions uh, are, are very useful because they help us understand something about how the system works, an underlying um, a feature uh, of, of the system. And so, for example, um, if we want us to understand vision and hearing, uh, we can tweak some of these uh, rules of uh, perceptual integration, so the temporal or the spatial rule, slightly and see what the output of perception is, and that helps us understand something about uh, the underlying uh, system. And so, uh, one classic example is what's known as a ventriloquism illusion. So this illusion gets its name from the classic dummy act, where you, you have a person uh, not moving their lips, uh, and instead they have a, a dummy in their hand, and they're moving the lips of the dummy, and people commonly misperceive the sound to be coming from the location uh, where the lips are moving. But this, this is also present in our homes every day. So if you, if you watch television, um, the speakers, you'll notice, don't actually have to be in the location where you're watching the television. Uh, they can be anywhere in the room, in fact. They could be over here, but you're still gonna, folks are still going to perceive the sound to come from the location where they see the action happening, where the visual event is happening, in, in what is, uh, could arguably be the original multimodal uh, device. And uh, so in the laboratory, we use this, uh, this illusion, and what we do is we uh, ask participants, we present participants with an uh, auditory stimulus, and then we present them with a visual stimulus at the same time, but in slightly different locations. And then we ask, we measure where they perceive uh, the sound. Um, and of course, when we do that, what we see is a very clear bias. So people are very, uh, they're biased towards the visual stimulus. They misperceive the sound as coming from where they see the visual stimulus. Um, but more striking is <clears throat> they're actually better at localizing uh, sounds uh, presented in the same location as a visual stimulus than they are when they're asked to localize sounds presented alone. Um, this is important for uh, something I'll talk about a little later. Uh, so uh, before I get into this, so <clears throat> this is all very bottom up. So you combine two pieces of information and the system will integrate it and uh, create an output and perception. Um, it's also, <clears throat> we, are, uh, we are humans, we have uh, cognitions and emotions and feelings, etc. And so uh, an open question in this field is what, to, to what role, to what extent uh, do uh, top-down, uh, so these cognitions, emotions, and feelings affect this sensory processing. And so one of the most basic forms of cognition, arguably, is uh, imagining a sensory stimulus. So imagining a visual stimulus, for example. What we asked is, can you imagine a visual stimulus and produce the same uh, illusory effect uh, on auditory perception? And the answer is yes. So if you ask participants uh, to imagine the visual stimulus, uh, in the same, uh, in a location, and you present an auditory stimulus uh, at the same time, but in a slightly different location, their auditory perception will be shifted in the location of the imagined visual stimulus. Um, and so uh, I've done some neuroimaging work in this area um, to demonstrate uh, not only to identify the areas that are responsible for this illusion, um, uh, which is a, in an area known as a superior temporal sulcus. This is a part of the brain that is between the visual and the auditory cortex, and so uh, this is an area that um, seems ideally situated to integrate uh, auditory and visual information, and it does when the information is uh, presented to them is, is real. Um, and it's also uh, correlated with the strength of this ventriloquism illusion. So the, str the more of a bias you had towards a visual stimulus, the stronger the activity is in this area. Um, and we also looked at the connectivity patterns in the brain uh, between the auditory cortex and this uh, STS region, and we see increased connectivity between the auditory cortex and this uh, uh, multisensory uh, portion of the cortex when 
uh, the illusion is, is experienced, so when you have this bias uh, of sound towards vision. Um, and what's also striking here is this, we found exactly the same effect when you have participants imagine a visual stimulus. Um, so that not only were they biased, but their brains looked exactly the same as when they had, uh, were presented with a real visual stimulus. Um, so uh, the reason that this, this is striking or this is important is because when you imagine something, uh, what we're asking here is we're asking people to imagine something uh, you know, by asking them, you know, hey, you see this, uh, this white flash on the screen, now imagine it in three seconds later, three, two, one, imagine it. But it's very possible to elicit these kinds of uh, visual representations, or they could be auditory, um, in a, a implicitly. So, for example, um, you know, if your cell phone buzzes in your pocket, that might elicit a very strong uh, visual cue or auditory cue implicitly that could then affect uh, ongoing sensory perception in a different sensory modality. Um, so it's not just the case that these have to be uh, sort of uh, effortful um, perceptual events that are occurring um, real time, but they could also be uh, perceptual events that are sort of conjured up from other uh, sensory events that are happening in the environment. So all of this that I've just talked about is all real time. So this is happening um, all in the moment. So perception is being biased uh, at the same time you're hearing something or seeing something. But it's, uh, we're in, in separate line of research, we also uh, investigated uh, the role of plasticity. So if you're repeatedly, we asked, if you're repeatedly exposed to this, will this bias future auditory perception? So if I constantly hear, uh, see a visual stimulus uh, to hear, and I hear an auditory stimulus over, uh, in between, uh, for example, where the real source of the auditory stimulus is, will this bias eventually uh, uh, have some sort of plasticity in, in, the, in the brain um, to change future perception when I'm only hearing sounds in the future? And so we have a, we have a way of, of measuring this. We use a psychophysics technique in which we ask participants simply, uh, did the sound come from the left or the right? And uh, we present sounds in different locations in front of them. And then we ask them to uh, press, uh, and, then we, and then we measure their uh, psychophysical curve here in black, and we get a pretty good estimate. So they're about 50% when the sound's presented right in front of them, and 100% you know, accuracy when it's presented pretty far to the right. And so we, we use this as a sort of baseline and then what we do is we, uh, we uh, bias their, we, we repeatedly expose them to, for example, 30 second periods of uh, visual stimulus in one location and an auditory stimulus in another location. For example, the visual stimulus to the right here of a sound. And then we measure their subsequent uh, change in perception. And what we see is a bias in perception in the direction of the previously associated visual stimulus. So you're really, shifting the uh, auditory uh, uh, field uh, in the direction of the previous bias. So when, when you, this is, uh, when, if I give an example of this, this is as if you're going, you're in the movie theaters, uh, you're watching uh, the, the uh, movie, and you're um, hearing, all the audio is coming from one speaker on the far left, you're constantly misperceiving the sound to be coming from where the action is happening um, in the screen in front of you. And then if I ask, if I close, if I uh, turn off the movie theater and it's perfectly, or turn off the screen and it's perfectly dark inside, um, and I present a sound still from the same speaker, you will actually misperceive that sound as coming directly in front of you. Okay, that's the basic principle. Um, yeah. Does it matter if the sound and visual stimuli are compatible or incompatible? Um, compatible how? In the sense that, you know, if there is a flash and there is, a, you know, gunshot versus flash, music there is there is what's known as uh so in perceptual research a, a unity assumption hypothesis so it's you're more likely to bind things that seem more likely to be related so for example uh it'd be harder for you even if things happen at the same time and location for you to bind seeing a kitten um bark than it would seeing a kitten uh meow for example um there that's known as a unity assumption hypothesis i haven't gotten really into that very much but yes you're, you're very correct there yeah um, anyway, we also see this uh, remapping of acoustic space from uh, imagined stimuli. So this doesn't just have to be bottom-up, this can also be top-down. So you can be imagining this uh, visual stimulus and uh, remap acoustic space in the same way. This can be a top-down process as well. So all of the effects that I've talked about so far, 
have been um, what is sort of consistent with our, uh, our, our, our belief that vision dominates all other senses. But I'm going to show you a few examples right now because I think they're important of uh, how sound can actually uh, influence vision as well. So if you uh, look at the uh, video on the left here, uh, often people, or most often people, will misperceive this as being two flashes. Um, I'll play it again. And if I play the video on the right, you will very clearly see just one flash. Um, this has to do with the fact that uh, sound has a higher temporal resolution than uh, vision does. And so in this context, uh, sound actually dominates vision and can lead you to misperceive uh, that flash as two flashes. Um, I'll give you another example of how sound can influence vision. So um, if you uh, just look at the video here on the left, Um, and most people will see these uh, discs to cross. If I play the video on the right, most people will see these discs to bounce. Um, and so some subsequent work we did in this area shows that if I play this video on the left again, most people will clearly see that to cross. Um, and if I play this video on the right, most people will clearly see that to bounce. Even though those sounds are exactly the same, only the first sound was the second sound played backwards. Um, so, vision, uh, can, so sound can also influence uh, vision, um, depending on the context and depending on the importance uh, of, of the information from each sense in a given context. So, uh, I'm gonna, what we also did is we explored whether or not uh, these sort of uh, um, effects of sound on vision could uh, lead to plasticity of the visual uh, system. So to understand this next illusion, I'm going to uh, give you a, sh a quick example of uh, a visual, sorry, a visual illusion. So if you guys pay close attention to the uh, uh, center of the screen there, look at the purple dot and I'll play the video and keep looking. So most people will see a pretty, have a pretty strong visual motion after effect here, in which uh, you're, um, you're going to see the uh, waterfall is moving downward, right? And so this has to do with uh, plasticity in the visual cortex. So repeated exposure to visual motion in this direction um, leads to an after effect, which uh, leads to visual motion perception in the opposite direction of static images. So what we did is we asked, can sound elicit this same effect? So if I'm repeatedly exposed to this waterfall uh, from sound only, for example, can that then influence my future visual-only perception? And so we did this, again, using psychophysics, so, which I explained a little bit earlier. And basically what we do is we, we have these random dots here that move uh, in a random orientation, and we manipulate the coherence of those dots. So they're either 100% random, or 100% moving to the left, or 100% moving to the right, and then various stages in between. And so what we do is we ask participants, did the dots move to the left or to the right on a trial-by-trial -trial basis? Uh, before we give them this little test, what we do is we presented them with auditory stimuli uh, that were uh, moving in a specific direction, in this case, uh, left to right or right to left. So we have, uh, for example, it's the example that's easiest for folks to understand is imagine you're sitting, standing in front of a freeway and you're hearing uh, cars whiz past, past you. Left to right, left to right, left to right, or right to left, right to left, right to left. Um, and then we ask you again, uh, you know, were these dots moving uh, to the left or to the right? And then we have various different coherence levels of those dots. And what we see is a significant shift in uh, the perceptibility of these dots in the, in, the, in the opposite direction, exactly like this waterfall illusion. 
So if you heard left to right sounds, you're actually going to be biased as seeing a static image move right to left. Um, so that's a basic uh, finding. So to summarize these, uh, this work that, that we've been doing before, uh, I'll say that the integration of information from our different senses can lead to dramatic changes in how we perceive the world around us. Um, and examining each sense in isolation within a multisensory environment will lead to failures to predict the output uh, of perception. Uh, furthermore, the influence of one sense over another does not rely on the inherent dominance of one sense per se, uh, but rather the quality of the information provided by each sense in a given context. Um, and furthermore, uh, our brains not only integrate sensory information that is just bottom up, but can also integrate information that is uh, elicited top down. Uh, so, moving forward with devices, so one of the things we wanted to ask was, can we utilize uh, this, this knowledge we have about the plasticity of uh, perceptual systems uh, to uh, improve auditory perception using generic HRTF? So, one of the problems in virtual reality with recreating uh, 3D acoustics uh, is that um, in order for us to have a really strong uh, 3D um, acoustic uh, perception, uh, to replicate that accurately, we need to uh, take into account the uh, distance between the user's ears, uh, the shape of the body, uh, the head, and the ears themselves, the pina uh, in the ears. Um, however, this is very time consuming, it's quite difficult, and uh, it's hard to scale. Uh, so one thing that we asked was, can we use just generic HRTFs that aren't catered to each individual, which do an okay job in terms of how people perceive th uh, sound in 3D space, uh, can we improve their perceptual experience by using these cross-modal plasticity mechanisms? And so uh, I'll play this video, which sort of describes what we did. So this is the sound. What they're doing is they're uh, looking, uh, localizing the sound. This is a split screen because it's a two uh, display in the HMDs. But um, this pointer here is what they're using to indicate uh, where they think they hear the sound uh, along the horizontal plane, which is there in the distance. <clears throat> And so participants first did this. This is their sort of baseline localization. Um, and then we had a series of conditions uh, where they were exposed to 30 second periods of just this sound alone. And right now it's actually moving around in 3D space randomly. Okay, so you, if you were hearing this through audio, you would hear the sound sort of moving in different locations. Continuously moving. Uh, Or in the other condition, they were exposed for 30 seconds to, uh, to the, the same auditory stimulus moving around randomly, but this time paired with a visual stimulus. And the idea here is that the pairing of the visual stimulus in 3D space with the, 3D, uh, the sound in 3D space, um, both in the same uh, space and time, should lead to a um, remapping of acoustic space for the user, hopefully. And indeed, I'll skip, there's a couple other conditions here. But indeed, what we see is, uh, if you uh, focus on the second plot here, is you see an improvement in auditory source localization afterwards when they're just presented with the sounds alone as they were in the first part. Uh, they actually improved uh, their source localization through only brief periods of exposure to this audiovisual stimuli. In other conditions, we also uh, dissociated the... Uh, uh, we added physics to the sound of the moving ob visual objects. So, so you hear a sound moving around in 3D space, and you see the visual object. And then at the same time, when it moves, switches directions, uh, we, we added a collision sound. So it's like dunk, 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 and it's moving around, uh, only just helping to boost uh, the uh, association of this visual object with the sound in 3D space. If you disassociate them temporally, so if they're not exactly paired uh, if you don't think that the clunk, 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 clunk sound is paired with the visual object, then, you, then folks also don't uh, associate that high-pitched frequency sound with the visual object either, and you, you sort of uh, don't see this effect. Um, 
So there's very good reasons for this. I won't get into it. You can ask questions later. Uh, so that was uh, in the audiovisual domain, but uh, moving on to other sensors, um, we asked, can we expand haptic perception in virtual reality uh, beyond two independently handheld controllers by using only two independently handheld controllers? And I'm being intentionally redundant there um, because from the outset it sounds a little bit insane. How could you experience touch from more than uh, the two places that you're receiving touch? Um, but there might be a possibility, so findings in Actually, psychology um, and cognitive neuroscience have found that if you present vibrotactile stimuli to participants in two, uh, in two locations, so you present three stimuli in two locations, two of them come from one spot and the other one comes from a different location at a in, in a particular temporal sequence. So the timing goes something like this. You feel taps one and two like this. And between tap two and three, you only feel this. So it's like the, the entire sequence together is, okay? And what people perceive is that the second tap actually come from the location uh, between taps one and two. Um, so uh, this effect can be boosted uh, by adding a visual stimulus in the location uh, that you want them to misperceive uh, the second tap. So in this case, um, uh, you know, the multi-sensory context can actually boost the illusion very much um, uh, to misperceive touch uh, in a location you're not receiving it. Uh, this effect, more strikingly, was, was uh, expanded upon uh, in subsequent work. So if the participants are, it doesn't just have to be on a continuous space on the body. If the participants are holding an object, um, and they know they're holding an object, and the, and the, ta the vibrotactile stimuli are delivered just to their fingertips in this particular temporal sequence, they will misperceive the second touch uh, to come from somewhere uh, between their fingers uh, in the middle of the object. So they will sort of not feel the object to come from their finger where it actually does, but actually misperceive it as coming uh, on the object that they're holding. And what's interesting here is that if, uh, if they're not holding an object at all, again, their eyes are actually closed here, but if they're not holding an object at all, um, then they, this illusion doesn't exist at all. So they accurately perceive, I felt two touches here and one touch here. Um, so we, we brought this to virtual reality. So we asked, can you, uh, if you're just holding two controllers in, in virtual reality, uh, but you see a stick rendered between your hands, and you, will you misperceive the touch from the two independent controllers as occurring uh, in the space between the hands on the stick, even though you know going into the experiment, going into the virtual environment, that you're holding two independent controllers? And so it looks a little bit like this, if you look at the video on the bottom here. And then the participants report uh, where they perceive each of the touches. And what we see is, indeed, you can. So if, uh, if you deliver the, the vibrotactile stimuli in this particular temporal sequence, the second touch uh, will be misperceived uh, as occurring on the stick that they're holding in virtual reality. Um, what's really striking, uh, it, what's important here is that it's not just the visual cues that were provided that elicit this illusion. They help boost the illusion, but if you take uh, if you present the same exact visual cues, but you alter the timing, so now the participants feel the touch, the overall timing is exactly the same, but now they feel them instead of, they, in, instead of feeling in that temporal sequence, instead they feel. So the time uh, between taps one and two is uh, shorter, which is natural with our everyday experience. Uh, and the time between taps two and three is longer, which is also natural with our everyday experience, then uh, we accurately perceive them. And the reason for this is, the reason that we misperceive the touch in the first case is because the time between taps two and three is very short, um, but the distance is large. And so what our brain does is interpolates, uh, and it decides, okay, well, because they uh, occurred very close in uh, time, but in very different locations, they must have also occurred very close in space. And so the natural assumption of the brain is that, oh, the tap actually occurred in a location it didn't. It occurred 
on a stick uh, between my hands. Anyway, so uh, we also utilized, so encouraged by this pretty robust effect, uh, we utilized this finding to ask other questions about, uh, that are important for our perception in virtual reality. But to get into that, uh, first I want to sort of uh, describe, I want you to understand uh, the importance of body ownership on visual perception. Um, and so there's been a lot of work done in virtual reality on um, embodying different kinds of avatars or bodies, having a body in virtual reality. And I'm going to just uh, play this video, which is narrated by Nor Morgan Freeman here, uh, that uh, describes uh, this a little bit, how this illusion works. A blindfolded subject is led into a room with two beds, one for himself and the other for a small doll. It's important that you try not to move during the experiment, okay? We use head-mounted displays that we connect to cameras. So it's two screens in front of the participant's eyes, and each screen is connected to one video camera, which we can mount on the head of a mannequin or a doll. So when you look down, you don't see your own body anymore, you see the doll from the natural first-person perspective. The subject feels the stroking on his leg, but sees the stroking on the doll's leg. So his brain is fooled into thinking that the doll's legs are actually his own. It happens then is the brain just fuses what you see and what you feel, and boom, you feel like the doll or the mannequin. Well, we think the brain creates like an internal model of your own body. And we think the brain does that by integrating all available information from all the senses and be part of making that decision that this is me or this is not me. Having tricked the brain into a false reality, Henrik can now tweak that reality and reveal how powerful the subconscious actually is. The researcher threatens the doll with a knife. The subject flinches with horror. His brain can't help but expect excruciating pain. Even after the subject realizes it was a trick, he continues to have the same reaction when the illusion is repeated. His conscious experience cannot override his subconscious reaction. You can't think it away. You know it's just you know, an experiment. But you can't help that bodily feeling of uh, because you feel that this doll is you. So your brain just reacts in a very sort of basic way. And that signal, this reaction is what we're measuring to really prove that the illusion is, is working. So uh, this is how uh, we can elicit illusions of body ownership in virtual reality. Um, so you just combine visual, tactile, and proprioceptive information from the body. Um, you combine them in, a, in the right uh, way and at the right timing, and participants will actually misperceive a different body as their own. But what's important here to understand is uh, that subsequent work on this not only showed that you can embody different sized avatars uh, or bodies, but you can, that the size of the body actually made a huge difference on our perception of the world that we're in. So, for example, in a small body, you will misperceive objects to be much larger than they actually are when you're asked uh, to indicate how big objects are. And uh, if you're asked to uh, get up and walk to a target in the room uh, with your eyes closed, so you, you, you're in the small body and then you stand up but your eyes are closed, and then uh, you're asked to walk to a, a target that you saw beforehand, you will actually walk further than the actual target. So distances are actually perceived as being much further than, than they are when you're in your normal sized body. And conversely, of course, if you're in a very large body, distances will be, appear to be shorter, so you'll walk less, and uh, uh, the size of objects will appear to be smaller. So all this is just to emphasize that the body that we're in has an important, uh, has important implications for how we perceive uh, the environment we're in. And so we asked, uh, how important is it to have a body for the perception uh, of haptics in VR? And we made use of this new illusion that we have, uh, this haptic illusion, as a sort of implicit measure of, uh, of the, ex the perceptual experience of haptics while in VR. And so I'll play this uh, video um, from our IEEE VR submission. Oops.
So participants here are in, a, in a, uh, an avatar, and they're looking at themselves uh, in this me virtual mirror. Um, so they have a very strong uh, sense of body ownership, and previous work uh, has shown that uh, having a mirror in virtual reality uh, with an avatar can actually boost your sense of ownership over the avatar you're looking at. And then uh, we elicit this illusion of touch on a virtual object, and we ask participants to report where they perceive the touch. Um, and in this case, uh, I think in a moment, the uh, nobody uh, version will be present. Yeah, so here you'll see that the participants have no body, um, but everything is kept exactly the same. And we elicit the illusion, and we ask them, where did you feel the touch? And in this case, what we find, if you focus first on the solid lines, we replicate this, uh, this illusion of touch very strongly. So participants misperceive the second tap to occur um, in the space between the hands. But if you look at when they had no body, even though they were equally as capable of identifying the source of taps one uh, and two, uh, they, they uh, did not experience uh, this illusion of touch as strongly as they did when they had a body, suggesting that uh, the, the body also has an important role to play in our haptic perception in virtual reality and in our experiences in virtual reality in general. Um, so encouraged by this, uh, we, we also uh, revisited this question, can haptic perception of VR be, in the, uh, uh, be extended beyond two independent controllers? Um, so another technique that's possible to elicit uh, illusory sense of touch is uh, what's known as a technique as funneling. Uh, and so basically, if you modulate the amplitude of two independently handheld controllers in a linear way, so the stronger amplitude, contr uh, one controller, for example, on the right has a strong amplitude, and one controller on the left, for example, has a weaker amplitude, folks will misperceive the touch uh, to be uh, at a point that's uh, in between the hands and actually a little bit closer to the right hand in this example. Um, and so we extended this to virtual reality. Uh, and so we did this from uh, 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 controllers and virtual reality while participants were holding a virtual stick. And we asked them to indicate where they perceived uh, the touch. Uh, and this, the benefit of this uh, illusion, or, or this, this uh, illusion compared to the previous one, is that um, it, uh, it, only, it can be elicited from only one uh, vibrotactile stimulus at a time, so meaning uh, you just have a one-off uh, vibration and then you can, uh, you can feel touch in between the hands, whereas the previous one requires a temporal sequence of at least three uh, touches. So you feel one here, and then one in the middle, and then one here. And in this case, you can just uh, vibrate both controllers at the same time, but at different amplitudes, and then it'll elicit a, an illusion of touch in between. The other benefit is that you can elicit uh, the illusion of touch in more locations than just one in between the hands. So you could elicit it ostensibly here, uh, here, here, and here, etc., depending on the uh, relationship between the amplitudes of the two controllers. And so we ex did this in virtual reality. We asked participants uh, to indicate where they perceived the touch with different amplitude modulations, uh, five different amplitude modulations. And we see uh, that they're accurately, uh, they're able to, we elicited this illusion both when we presented visual stimuli where we wanted, where the intended illusory location was, and when we don't uh, present visual stimuli. So this illusion can actually be elicited without uh, the co-presence of a little white marble in the location we want them to experience the illusion, which also has its benefits. Uh, uh, so what well, we also wanted to use this illusion to study um, uh, how this uh, increased spatialization of haptics can affect the user's experience uh, of immersion within the virtual environment. So, so these illusions have, in these illusions, we've been able to expand haptic perception uh, in virtual reality between just uh, between the hands. So, not just from the controllers, we're able to actually experience haptics from different locations, 
Um, but of course, if we're doing that and we're not actually improving the user's experience, then what's the point? So uh, what we wanted to do is a sort of user study to investigate uh, whether or not where this increase in haptic perception is actually increasing, uh, improving the user's level of immersion within the virtual environment. Um, and so what we do is we elicit this illusion in a very simple task. The participants simply place their hands into a cloud and then they uh, receive one of four conditions. They place the hands with a stick inside the cloud, as you see here, and they feel either no haptic feedback, they receive uh, generic haptic feedback, which is just a vibration every once, about once per second, or they receive spatialized haptic feedback using this funneling technique, so they feel that the touch is moving in different locations while their hand is in this cloud, or they receive uh, spatialized haptic feedback along with a visual stimulus that's moving in the same location we want them to experience the illusion. And so what we, from the outset, what we th are thinking here is that the more haptic feedback you receive, the better the haptic feedback you receive, the better the user experience or the level of immersion should be within the virtual environment, right? So if you're improving the haptic experience, you're hopefully improving uh, their level of immersion. Uh, uh, and so what we did is we had them do this, uh, each of these conditions, and then we asked them a series of questions which included, for example, how aware were you of the real world uh, during the experiment? How, how, did the, uh, how real did the virtual stick seem to you, et cetera? And then we had a series of questions just to verify that they also experienced the increased spatialization of the haptics when we were uh, using this funneling illusion. And what we see is when we look uh, first just at the uh, spatial, uh, the, the reported uh, spatial perception was that um, the spatialized haptics and the visual plus spatialized haptics elicited um, uh, spatialization. The participants actually perceived that they were uh, feeling touch move uh, between their hands, um, which is good. Um, but when we looked at the level of immersion, uh, there was sort of a curious uh, pattern of results in which uh, actually uh, the level of immersion uh, was decreased uh, when the participants were receiving this increased spatialization, spatialized haptics without visual feedback. So in this case, they were putting their hands into a cloud and they're feeling the touch move in different locations and it was actually bringing them out of the uh, virtual experience rather than uh, improving their experience. Um, and so this is uh, related, uh, when we look at this curve, it looks very similar uh, to uh, the theoretical curve of the uncanny valley of uh, humanoid robotics in which sort of the closer you approach uh, a human-like uh, form uh, that elicits a sort of revulsion before you approach uh, an actual human. Um, and uh, so what we're sort of identifying here, it seems to be sort of a, 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 an uncanny valley of haptics, whereas uh, the, the better your haptic experience gets, it doesn't necessarily uh, fully improve your experience uh, uh, within the vir virtual environment, uh, but it may actually be drawing you out. And the reason for this um, uh, seems to be that the more you're improving the, the haptic experience, the incre you're increasing the user's expectations uh, of the visual feedback from the environment. Uh, so uh, if you're receiving just generic haptic feedback, that seems totally okay. If you're just doing something very generic, uh, like placing your hand into a cloud, but if you're receiving increase spatialized haptics, but you're not receiving any visual cues or information about the environment at the same time that are sort of meet the expectations from this increased spatialization, then you're not actually improving their experience. Uh, and so we did subsequent experiments. Uh, so just like in, in the case of the uh, uncanny valley of humanoid robotics, one of the things uh, that's been found is that uh, you can actually change the location of this valley by manipulate or, or recover the, the valley totally by manipulating the uh, features that violate the user's expect or the viewer's expectations uh, from this increase uh, in like likeliness to a to a human. So, for example, uh, in the case of robotics, you can uh, have more cartoonish features of the robot, even though it's very human-like, um, and that's totally acceptable and doesn't el elicit this revulsion. In the case of haptics here. Uh, what we did is we tried to reduce uh, the violation or the prediction error of the participants um, when they were experiencing this increased spatialization from haptics and the visual environment by adding some new visual information uh, to the environment that might 
uh, improve their experience. And we did this in one experiment in which all we did was in that cloud that they placed the hand inside of, sorry, uh, in that cloud that they placed the hand inside of, uh, it, we actually just, when they placed their hands inside the cloud, the cloud just rotated slightly. And this seemed to be sufficient for the participants to drastically recover uh, this, this experience of uh, immersion within the virtual reality, even though there was no specific feedback really given, but it just, it just goes to show that the increased expectations from the increased spatialization um, can be met by a very, uh, very subtle uh, causal cues within the environment. Um, and then, because of course in virtual reality it's important um, that we uh, do things in a context in which you can move. Um, and we investigated also if the participants are moving, how this affected their um, experience of the different kinds of haptics. And we also see that the valley shifts according, again, to their uh, increased uh, spatialization, according to their expectations from the haptic feedback. And so, in this case, um, all of the uh, haptic feedback they received when they moved their hands was good, um, except when uh, the visual feedback, so in the, in the case when the visual stimulus was moving around on the stick, except for when the visual feedback uh, wasn't congruent with their movement. So now you have a different issue. The, the spatialized haptics was very good, but the visual feedback of the sphere moving on the, thing, on the, on the stick um, didn't have any physics to it at all. It just kind of floated there. And so this violated their sort of um, uh, expectations and brought them again out of the virtual experience. Um, uh, so we have a very short uh, video from our uh, Kai submission on this. All right, um, so to summarize uh, the findings from, from uh, the past five months here, we've, we sort of uh, can condense these into some sort of principles, which are, it seems, uh, I can say that it seems as though multisensory processing capacity of the human brain remains to be a, a largely untapped resource uh, for getting the most out of multimodal devices, but uh, utilizing multisensory perception can enhance the user's experience uh, from these devices um, and may also be able to overcome certain output limitations uh, from devices. So we may not be able to uh, deliver the best haptics, for example, but that doesn't mean that we can't utilize these sort of multi-sensory principles to elicit uh, pretty, um, uh, pretty good haptic experiences uh, between the hands nevertheless. Um, thirdly, uh, tapping into multi-sensory principles of perception uh, may be able to push the boundaries of perception uh, and create entirely new experiences from the technology that we have today. And I, before I sort of uh, wrap up here fully, I'd like to uh, play sort of one last illusion for you. So uh, if you pay close attention to what you hear here uh, while watching uh, the uh, person's mouth. Ba, 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 ba. So most people uh, probably heard uh, da, 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 da. But if I play the video again. Ba, 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 ba. Most people will hear, it's exactly the same video, there's no tricks here, but uh, most people will hear uh, accurately ba, 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 ba. And so this illusion works uh, because the visual information uh, that you're seeing is ga, 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 and it's incongruent with the simultaneously presented auditory information that you're hearing, which is ba, 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 ba. And your brain makes a compromise, and it creates an entirely new uh, perceptual experience, which is da, 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 da. 
It doesn't exist in the real world. It's just a combination of two sensory inputs, um, and it elicits an entirely new experience, perceptual experience. And so what I, that's, I love this illusion uh, because it demonstrates very clearly how the two senses can combine to create a very new experience. And I, I also love it because uh, this is technology from the 1950s. Uh, we've evolved quite a bit in the technological landscape that we have today. And so I'm sort of excited about uh, what we can do uh, with the technology of tomorrow as technology begins to advance. Uh, and so uh, to wrap up, I'll just say thank you uh, to a few people here. So most of the work, basic science research that I've been doing uh, for the past several years uh, was done with uh, Professor Henrik Erson at the Karolinska Institute uh, in Stockholm, Sweden. And uh, all the work that I've been doing here uh, at Microsoft Research has been done uh, in, uh, closely uh, together with uh, Mar Gonzalez Franco. And uh, so uh, moving on here, I'll be uh, headed to Caltech uh, in a, at the end of this week um, to start a position there. And uh, I'll be working uh, with Professor Shinsuke Shimojo, who runs a psychophysics laboratory in the Division of Biology and Biological Engineering at Caltech. Um, and uh, I would, uh, a lot of the work that I've talked about um, and cited um, was also uh, work originally uh, done by him in the basic science sector. So. Um, thank you very much. Yeah. Is it accurate to say that almost all of the illusions which you showed are happening pre-attentively? Say it again. All the illusions which you showed seem to be happening pre-attentively, right? In the sense that there's no sort of higher order processing which is going on, higher order reasoning or anything like that. Well, that's actually not the case. So in the case of, for example, um, some of them are, are, pre, are pre attemptive in the sense that they're very bottom-up. This is sort of the distinction I'm making between bottom-up and top-down. Um, so in the top-down uh, stuff that I, I've done, so when it's very attentive, so participants are, are actually imagining visual stimuli. And that imagined visual stimulus is integrating with simultaneously presented sounds to change, for example, spatial location of sound, or uh, they can imagine sounds um, in the case of the, the motion bounce illusion with the, the balls crossing, if you imagine that sound, um, it'll actually change visual perception in the same way, for example. So it doesn't have to be pre-attentive in that sense. It can also be uh, very top-down. Um, yeah. There are also some semantic effects uh, on, on perception which are very attentive related, like, like we talked about uh, from your question earlier about um, involving the unity assumption principle. So uh, making sure that the stimuli make sense in the right context um, from a semantic standpoint. Yeah. Hey, uh, you can probably guess what I'm going to ask, but uh, I'm just wondering, I really like your last point about using the perceptual stimulus and, and perceptual illusions to create novel experiences or create better devices. Yeah. Do you have any insights in what would be a principled way to actually go about that particular direction? Because everything that you showed right now seems to be going the opposite direction, of like using the devices to understand more the, the principles, they understand more yeah. the perceptual principles. But well, I, I would I'm say more, I'm more I, curious about the other. Yeah, so I would say, actually, um, sort of missed a beat um, in this presentation, in which I, uh, I would say that most of the work that I've been doing here uh, is really turning this question on its head. So I'm not really using. Um, I'm not really using the illusion to understand the mechanisms of perception. I, that's the work I've sort of been doing before. Instead, what I've done in most of the work I've been doing here is really sort of trying to apply these principles that we've learned about sensory perception um, to uh, devices in a, you know, and trying to elicit, for example, illusions of touch you know, can, uh, or improve uh, spatial localization of sound um, through generic HRTF. So trying to improve uh, maybe the technologies themselves, but really the, the experience through the technologies um, from these principles. So in that sense, it is sort of, sort of the, the, the hope or the approach that we've been trying to take um, so far. How we could do it further is uh, basically continue to sort of make sure that we incorporate this kind of information that we know about uh, the principles of multisensory integration, which are, for example, uh, the, the space and time 
uh, playing around with them a little bit. So, uh, you know, being able to, knowing the window of uh, the integration of sight and sound and playing around with it a little bit to, you know, um, to make up for maybe a deficit in, um, in one of the in outputs from a, from, a, from a device, for example. Um, I don't know if that sort of answers your question or not, but. Curious about how I get asked this question a lot in terms of how do some of these experiences scale, right? Like yeah. how do you actually apply them in principle way to to create a more convincing generic experience or like something that's uh, beyond the uh, the example part? And yeah, I don't. Yeah. You might not have the answer. I don't think I have the answer either. But I'm I'm saying like I'm I'm curious about your thoughts on, on that topic. Like, yeah, I mean, depends on the example, but. Something, for example, that comes up like almost immediately is, you know, in the case of haptics, you know, we're using vibrotactile actuators. Um, that has its limitations, obviously, but um, you know, you know, some of the commercially available devices, you know, don't allow you to modulate the amplitude. You know, uh, if you can't modulate the amplitude, you can't do the funneling illusion that we just uh, demonstrated. Um, if you can modulate the amplitude, um, then you can. And so, for example, you know, moving forward with technology, then we should probably make sure that you you have the possibility of having a viable tactile actuator that you can modulate the amplitude of if you want people to experience, you know, a spatialized sense of touch in virtual reality, for example, um, you know. Questions: What you said that sound has a higher temporal resolution than other senses. What, what, what did you mean by that? So I meant that the um, that our perceptual system, so the the brain. Uh, processes sound faster than it processes visual information, and it therefore, sort of, uh, uh, when we're in a given multi when we're in a given context, sound can actually um, be a more reliable uh, 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 sense for uh, temporal sequences than vision can. For sequences. Yeah, temporal. It can be sequences, so it can be time, um, but it can be also, um, you know. Uh, in the example that I gave, how many of these were there? Okay. And the follow-up was, and Eric related to that, as you said, vision overpowers all other senses. So... I said that, I meant, sorry, sorry. I meant that vision, um, that, uh, that the sort of lay, lay belief uh, for most of us is that vision is the most dominant sense, uh, that it dominates all other senses. That was actually, I should say, also... Not just the lay belief that that was actually the the belief um, in the multisensory literature uh, for for many years that folks uh, really only thought that um, vision would dominate almost any other sense that came um, that was in incongruent with it. Um, but in this case, um, in the examples that I show, it was just to show that sound can actually also influence vision, given the right context, given the right uh, given which modality is more reliable in that context, etc. Are there any studies that uh, probe the difference between the real and imagined uh, stimuli? It's like so you, you can imagine doing a study where like, you imagine the, the sound, the, the, the flash at one position, right? And then you could, um, but you could have it be incongruent with like a real stimulus that is sort of juxtaposed with it. Like, so you might be able to, I'm wondering if they're just the same thing or if there's actually differences there you can manipulate. Yeah, you know, that's a really interesting question because I, I would say that most of the literature and most of the work that I've been doing is really always focused on how similar uh, imagination or imagined visual stimuli is to real uh, visual stimuli. Um, very little, because they are different, I think the underlying assumption is always has been in the literature that they are different. Uh, and so it's been a lot of work to sort of prove um, and a lot of arguing to prove that at least some part of uh, imagined stimuli accesses some similar um, neural machinery, so to speak, as real perception. Um, so the focus, the emphasis has really been on that. Um, but, yeah, it's a very interesting question. Like, uh, you know, to what extent they're different, to exactly why they're different, um, and things of that nature. One of the things that I've always been really interested in, for example, is, um, is the idea that uh, imagined stimuli are actually just very weak uh, real stimuli. Uh, so we're just accessing the same uh, uh, percepts uh, from a top-down manner. And then that information is, uh, you know, integrated with other sensory and in uh, sensory input at the same time. Um, uh, it's a hypothesis. Uh, it's a little bit hard to prove. There's some work and visual imagery uh, and visual perception that lend itself to this idea, but yeah. Yeah, 
be interesting to, to get at that because like if they're actually different, that gives you another lever to sort of manipulate these things, which kind of speaks to Banco's question to some extent. Because if you have something in like say the tutorial for some UI that comes up that biases people to think about it a certain way, yeah. you could actually influence their behavior. Yeah, so I, I didn't have time to really present it here, but there is this other work that's really interesting. Um, so the reason I, I get interested about uh, multi or, and, and mental imagery is this can also be elicited implicitly. So uh, like I said, so I tried to use the example of a phone vibrating in your pocket, but it could be anything. So one of the things uh, there's been work done, it's quite striking, is uh, understanding language. So they f there was a study that found this motion adaptation effect that I showed you. They found that if you read text, this is quite striking, if you're reading text that has a very vivid description of things moving upwards or downwards, it's auditory. Right? Like you're listening to language um, about like, you know, squirrels streaming down, for example, um, and things of that nature. It will actually elicit the same visual motion after effect. So that is the first sort of demonstration that sound can elicit a visual motion after effect. And I think there, more than the work that I've done, it, uh, shows, for example, that, uh, that uh, it can be elicited, like visual percepts can be elicited implicitly from, from language. Um, for example, um, and for, yeah. So, um, two of our main sense, like both like our audition and our vision are stereo. And a lot of the illusions that you create and a lot of the virtual environment is based on having two different yeah. stimuli and then you can generalize that because you just have two sensors. Yeah. Now for haptics, that's not the case. And then on your experiments, you essentially simulate the stereo by only having two mm -hmm. touch points in relation to the stuff in an environment that actually the other one will be interpolated by that. Mm -hmm. But how can, can but I, my mind is like it's hard to go much beyond the toy example where you want to have two points of contact and two real haptic sensors for you. So can you go any beyond that? Do you see any way Yeah. To... So there's actually work done um, from you know not between the hands and not from controllers, but there's actually work done, I think uh, some Disney has done some work, for example, um, with uh, vests or uh, chairs that have a minimal number of haptic actuators in the back that actually can elicit very strong, robust experiences of motion on your back, for example. So it is actually possible to scale up in that sense, but um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. So it, it's possible to elicit these kinds of illusion all over the body. It doesn't have to be just between the hands. It's sort of, for us, it's most striking that you can take commercially available controllers and elicit a sense of touch on an object you're not really holding. Um, and, and, you know, that has a, its, its own practical uh, implications. But it's also possible you know, to have a, a suit um, with not that many actuators and experience all kinds of uh, haptic experiences uh, from it, from not so many uh, 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 haptic actuators yeah, or vibrotactile actuators. If, does that answer your question? What are, what are the implications for uh, with this work on, you know, inducing multimodal percepts in people who may not have all, all the senses working very yeah. well or... Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, yeah. So actually some of the work I'm going to be doing uh, at Caltech is in, involves uh, sensory substitution and sensory augmentation. So ways that we can use multimodal principles um, to... Um, basically elicit maybe visual-like experiences in the blind or visually impaired um, or auditory-like experiences by uh, carefully uh, manufacturing uh, haptic and, and, and um, visual uh, information uh, together, um, things of that nature. Um, so it can have uh, an effect. So I can just say that there is some work showing, for example, that in the case of sensory substitution devices, there are some devices that are uh, commercially available now that allow uh, blind users to learn uh, to uh, to uh, see uh, visual objects that uh, in the world from sound, um, I think they can be optimized. I think there's ways of uh, of uh, improving their learning curve. So one of the sort of downsides to that work at the moment is that it requires a lot of um, uh, effort and time to to learn to understand uh, the, a visual world from sound um, in in the way that we are translating it, um, but. There's a lot of work to be done in this area, for sure. Yeah. You ever seen any tests done where, like, just to compare what what sensory um, 
signal has the most impact on a, on a, on a person. Like for example, I'm looking at an image of a pleasant scene of you know maybe uh, kids playing with a little puppy, but I'm hearing sounds of terror or something you know horrible. Mm -hmm. What do I feel? Am I feeling dread or am I feeling okay? Like which one? Which one impacts my my my, my senses more? Yeah. So there is some work done. Um, that's going to stretch uh, my memory a little bit at the moment, but there is some work done on 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 this in the in the area from a multisensory perspective um, when it comes to the unity assumption. So the so it's important that, for example, as I, the example that I gave earlier. So, you know, uh, we're going to bind information from seeing seeing a visual cat and hearing a, bar a barking dog, like those sounds, a little bit less well than we will um, information. Uh, you know, seeing a cat and hearing a cat meow. Um, uh, so I can say that. Um, but in terms of what you'll experience from an emotion, I mean, I think film uh, knows almost better than researchers how to how to elicit these kinds of things, right? Like you, you can watch a completely innocuous uh, scene, and if you play the right music, you can elicit all kinds of strong strong emotions, right? And so that's why. When I watch scary movies, I turn the sound off. <laughs> so, and then all of a sudden, they're very silly. Uh, so, but I don't know any specific work that I can uh, can link you to at the moment. But yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. I know that the, uh, seeing humans is something that's hardwired in us, uh, and I wonder if there's something that, you know, from a multisensory perspective, does hearing humans or seeing humans at the same time is there some interference there? You had an example where you had a human avatar with holding the stick in the reflection, but if you replace that with a less human avatar, like mm. a robot, That's a very or good question. like how much uh, humanness yeah. is required to uh, override or or heighten these mm -hmm. illusions? Yeah, so in the case of like virtual reality and owning different bodies, there's actually some really interesting or. A lot of the work actually has used, uh, looked at different kinds of avatars that you can embody. And one of the things that's actually very important is that it's humanoid. Um, so you can embody, for example, a, uh, it's very easy to embody a robot. Um, so that's kind of encouraging, but it's very difficult. Or it's, it, people don't embody, for example, a block of wood. Um, so yeah, so it, it does sort of need to be, uh, it is sort of hardware in us in, in that sense that we have to have a sort of, um, a body, a human-like body-esque shape. Um, but that said, there's also some work that's quite striking um, that shows that you can uh, have a, an extra limb, for example. So you can actually experience a, a third limb, uh, you know. Um, so as long as it's a human-like <laughs> uh, limb and things of that nature. Um, and what's even what I also find very interesting, which has actually applications in virtual reality that I, I think about often, um, especially with some of the commercially available devices and the environments that they produce, uh, is uh, that you can embody an invisible body quite easily. So if if you if you just look down in the virtual environment and you see nothing, but you 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 receive visual uh, tactile information and uh, at the same time. An experimenter stroking your body, for example, you can map out an invisible body, um, which is quite interesting because you can't embody a board, you know, or a stick, but you can embody empty space, um, which I think is kind of interesting. Um, uh, what's and there's a, there's one study that found, for example, that it, when you have people have an invisible body illusion and they stand in front of a crowd. Um, they actually uh, feel less uh, social anxiety than they do if they're embodied in a in a body, even if it's not their own in this environment, which is quite interesting. Anyway. Okay, I think this is it for today. Thank you very much, Chris, not only for the talk, but for the whole uh, five months of visiting here. It's been very intense. <laughs> But I think we all enjoyed uh, having you here, and I hope we can collaborate in the future. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.